Welcome to the Neuropathy Support Group and Podcast. I'm Chris, and I'm so glad you tuned in. It's my hope with this podcast to help all of us gather information that might help those that need support dealing with this debilitating issue. Before we get started, let's get the formalities out of the way with the medical and privacy disclaimer. I am not a doctor or medical professional. The information on this podcast is from personal experiences and is meant for group support. Additionally, the information discussed is not meant to diagnose, treat, or cure any underlying conditions associated with neuropathy. All names here within are private and will not be shared with any outside sources. Please consult your health care provider before making any health decisions. If you have medical concerns or an immediate emergency, please contact your doctor or dial 911. Hello everyone. Hope you have a great week right now. It's going smooth for you. Hopefully with some less pain. But I just wanted to pass along something with you before we get started. For the new listeners out there, my podcast... And myself, I'm not a professional at doing this. I'm just trying to bring information to the masses that have these issues of neuropathy and everything else that goes along with that. And I just want everybody to be in the know and to know that these things are happening or new doctors are uh, discovering new ways of helping with neuropathy. You can read it all for yourself, but I just want to pass it along to everybody so they understand that when you listen to my podcast, it's kind of rough. But I just, my hope, and I notice that not very many people are doing this kind of podcast, so I just wanted to pass as much information on to all of you. And in some way, hopefully it's helping you. We were talking about mental health. For the last two weeks and I'm going to continue talking about that but there was something that came up on my um, email the other day and I felt I needed to just hold off this week to just give you what I found just now um, this one is called pain provider red flags so these are the things that you need to watch out when you're going to a doctor maybe for the first time and these are some um, G flags that you want to watch out for, red flags, especially when you're, you know, you have an appointment and that's very important, especially with us having our neuropathy and other issues. We want to make sure that we get somebody that really knows what they're talking about. And that's what we're going to do today. So let's get started. When you struggle with pain, finding the right provider is critical to your physical health and your sanity. It's imperative that your doctor listens, understands, and believes you. The wrong provider results in unnecessary, sherry, counterproductive torment. Why won't they listen? Why don't they believe I know what works? Why do they think they know my body better than I do? Over the years, I've worked with many provider personalities the experience has allowed me to see behavior patterns, specifically those you should avoid. All right, here, so here we go here. Number four, the Dr. Gaslighter. The Dr. Gaslighter talks down to you. They explain things with a, con- with a conceding tone like you barely made it past kindergarten. I remember when my son was in ER with croup. I had that many, many times I had to take my daughter to handle the croup. Oh, geez, that was, oh, I hated those times. And an asthma attack, and we were discussing his treatment. The doctor instructed, give him four puffs of a butyrol. Butyrol never worked for my daughter. I replied, he can't tolerate that much a butyrol at once. It gives him unbearable anxiety. The doctor stood up taller, furrowed his brows, and responded, That's not possible. I clarified a side effect I have witnessed on multiple occasions and is written 
on the FDA label is not possible. The provider's knowledge gap does not make you dumb or irrational. Care is not productive or helpful with this type of personality. The next doctor is Dr. Narcissist. A Dr. Narcissist acts like the visit is about their brilliance, not you. They expect you to be impressed just by having the opportunity to meet with them. They don't allow you to ask questions about their decisions, and the medical profession is teeming with narcissism. Dr. Narcissism is a cousin of Dr. Gaslighter. The next is Dr. Inflexible. Dr. Inflex Inflexible is a provider who is too rigid or black or white. Clinical medicine is shades of gray. Not every Thing can be studied and supported by randomized controlled trials. Even fewer things can be studied accurately. If an action makes sense from a scientific standpoint and is low risk, it is important that the provider being open and considering it. The next one is Dr. Um, algorithm. Dr. Algorithm can't think beyond the guidelines. Patient care is not that simple. Guidelines are guidelines are not rules for reason. They don't apply to everyone. If a provider can't see you as unique, not shoving you into a computer generated formula may be too rigid. So those are some of the doctors there, but in conclusion, with this author, author of this page, listen to your intuition. You know when somebody gets you and your struggle. Add, and remember, second opinions are invaluable. There is surprising variation in treatment approaches among pain providers. If you feel uneasy, talk to another provider. The re reality is that not every clini clinician is a good fit for every person. Not every clinician is well trained in your medical condition, and not all providers are good clinicians. It's a spectrum from barely adequate to exceptional. So, <clears throat> when it comes down to it, you really need to be careful and to make sure, you know what, make sure you get some recommendations or try out other doctors. Also, you can look it up most likely on the internet under Yelp or one of those that kind of gives you experiences of what other people have um, dealt with going to certain doctors. So I forgot to mention at the very beginning, this episode, uh, podcast episode, is going to be on different subjects. So there could be up to three or four different subjects just on this episode here. Because the next episode, or the next part we're going to talk about is four things people with chronic back pain need to know so the you know like i said it's going to change up so chronic pain is complicated especially when no plastic pain is present this pain type amplifies the pain level it arises from abnormal sensory processing in the brain no cyplactic i've never even heard of that pain distorts mild back discomfort into a screw Cruciating pain. This cruel, confused pain signal looks lurks beneath many chronic pain conditions. You know, um, <clears throat> I had that issue with my, um, well, actually, this is with my uh, spine and spinal, not the cord, but the part with all the um, different ribs on there. It um, is affecting me because it's crushing one of the discs. In between there and we tried some things therapy ain't gonna work uh, went to a, a therapist for um, therapy and they said there's nothing they could do for me so I told the doctor that now we're gonna probably try to put the electronic sensory uh, device in my lower back and try that and see if that's gonna work what it does is it, it electrifies you know, sends pulses of electricity on your spine. So 
which goes to your brain and is supposed to, um, you know, have more mild of um, pain than what you usually do. I don't really know how it works yet. I haven't read too much up on it, but that's going to be one of my next um, ventures that I'm going to be getting involved in as soon as the insurance covers it. But um, other than that, you know, with with back pain, I've always, t to myself, I always said, if I ever had anything wrong with my back and they wanted to do surgery, that wasn't going to happen. I mean, I'm 60 years old and, you know, adding new parts to my back isn't going to help me. I mean, it may work for you. This, these are my thoughts on how I feel about back pain and how to fix it. Even my knees, you know, I wouldn't replace one of my knees because my knees, you know, started to de deteriorate. No. Because it's just going to cause more issues and problems if you do get it fixed. So it's just better, in my eyes, just to leave it alone and not have to worry about it. And just deal with some of the pain that you're having. Um, but let me see here. Here are four things people living with chronic pain want you to know. The pain does exist. It's not all in your heads. Most plastic pain is debilitating, but it does not show on standard medical tests. Someone with severe back pain from this type pain type may have only mild findings on imaging and on a normal exam. Physical ability with mostly normal tests results in an assumption the person is faking or exaggerating their limitations. The pain does come from their head, but only because their brain, which processes the pain, is located there. Give me a break. Most people are not seeking drugs. They are seeking relief. That's, that's all I want. Jeez. People with chronic pain are often mistreated and misunderstood. When their back hurts, it is hard to get through the day. The misery makes them desperate for relief. Given their distress level, they ask for opiate pain medications, but don't mistake their motivation. The majority are seeking relief, a reprieve from their pain prison. They are not asking for drugs to get high. Most are, opening, are open to trying anything that may help them. So see, doctors, we're not there just to want opiates so we can, you know, get high and feel better that way. No, we're just trying to relieve the pain that we have. And if someone comes in and says they have it, you know, believe them. All right. There's limitations come from more than just back pain. Back pain from no C plastic pain doesn't just affect the back. It affects the whole body. It also causes fatigue poor sleep, and thinking difficulties. They have less energy per day because of fatigue. Then poor sleep worsens the pain and fatigue. Plus, thinking difficulties like brain fog, slow, and muddle their, and muddle their cognition. When you add up all the symptoms, it is no wonder they struggle to function. They often suffer for years before the correct diagnosis is made. Imagine not being believed or helped for years before the correct source of your medical issue is identified. And that's what I'm going through. With a shortage of pain specialists, it can take years to find a medical provider who understands their pain, listens to them, and believes them. During these years, their entire life falls apart. They lose their jobs, struggle to pay for housing, care for their kids, and may even lose their relationships. All while seeing providers after provider who gives them a side eye because they don't see anything wrong with the medical tests. As well as, as, well as racking up thousands of dollars in medical bills for procedures that didn't help. Unfortunately, by the time no psychic plastic pain is identified, many had given up, defeated by years of misery and lack of help. These are common features in the journey 
of a person struggling with back pain. You know, it's it's just crazy why doctors just won't believe us. I mean, with us that have other types of pains, you know, sometimes other issues spawn from that pain. So, you know, I don't know. It's just unbelievable sometimes. I mean, like me, my pain doctor won't go any higher on my medication because he doesn't believe in doing that. So that's all right with me. But you know what? I could have went out and found another doctor somewhere if I wasn't happy with him not stopping, you know, what he's doing to me by stopping and not giving me any higher dosage or, or milligrams of the medication. That's fine. Because I look at it this way. He's looking out for me. And, of course, he's looking out for himself because he doesn't want to get reported to the DEA, you know. Saying, you know, them telling him, why are you giving so much of this milligrams to this person? So, I don't know. But, uh, let's see here. <clears throat> Another topic. Healing the pain no one can explain. So, here's our next subject we're going to talk about. How to check if nerve sensation is a factor in your pain. This should be good. Nerve sensation often contributes to chronic pain states such as back pain, migraines, and the irritable bowel. Sensation is an invisible cause of chronic pain. It does not show on medical tests. Sensation or synthesization is the result of abnormal processing of pain by the brain. Here are the clinical signs that suggest its presence. Pain persists long past the expected healing time. That's me, but I always blamed it on um, being diabetic, that it does take us a little bit longer to heal. For example, you strained your back nine months ago, but your back still hurt. A muscle strain should heal in three months or less. Number two, the symptoms spread beyond the boundary of the injury. Instead of a golf ball area of pain in your lower back, the pain spreads across your back and down your thighs, and that's what I have. Number three, a marked increase in sensitivity to stimuli develops. For instance, light touch or pressure on your back hurts. And number four, the presence of non-pain symptoms, including fatigue, poor sleep, and brain fog. You develop symptoms that affect your entire body. A clinical tool or symptom evaluator that screens for nerve sensation is central to the sensation inventory. This, uh, let me see here. They ask the test or the uh, evaluator ask about common sensation symptoms such as headaches and stiff, achy muscles. It also inquires about the non-pain symptoms like fatigue and difficulty sleeping. And for the final subject on this episode, how mindfulness practice reduces pain. The practice of mindfulness reduces pain levels in a couple of ways. First, it improves awareness of negative emotions and your ability to control them. Two, it reduces the connection between the parts of your brain that process pain and the parts that generate self-awareness. Together, these factors reduce the pain experience. Chronic pain is a physical and emotional experience. Your emotional state, whether it be sadness, frustration, or happiness, affects how, your experience, how you experience pain. Negative thoughts and emotions increase pain levels. For example, if you have a headache, and are angry about a work conflict, the pain feels worse than if you have the same headache while outside enjoying the sunshine, feeling content and free. Emotions affect the experience of pain because the brain processes the physical and emotional aspects of pain together. Number one, pain is registered in the brain through multiple out inputs. Number two, one set of inputs reports the location and intensity of the pain. Number three, another set of inputs connects to the emotional center for the brain called the limbic system and reports how unpleasant the pain feels. And number four, from here circuits adjust the pain signal either increasing or decreasing. 
Then the brain lets you know how it feels. A negative emotional state increases pain, whereas a positive state lowers pain. The practice of mindful, mindfulness improves your awareness and ability to regulate negative thoughts and emotions such as sadness, anger, and frustration, thereby reducing the pain experience. Mindful meditation decreases the communication between the parts of the brain responsible for re relaying pain information and the parts that generate self-awareness. There is, is awareness of self and there is awareness of pain, but they are not mixed into one. Because they aren't working as one, the pain level is lower. Think of this pain communication as if the self is not answering pain's phone calls. The weaker the connectivity between the two areas reduces the pain you experience. So here's some real quick uh, mindful meditation quick starts. Number one, sit in a comfortable position. Number two, focus on your breath. Pay attention to breathing in and out. Don't think or follow any thought streams that pop up. Say in as you breathe in and out. As you breathe out, these blocks intrusive thoughts. And number three, start with five minutes a day and work to 20 minutes a day. Find what works for you. During meditation, don't think about anything. If a thought pops up, do not follow it. Refocus on your breath. Think of your thoughts as clouds. You are watching them and letting them pass. Focus on blue skies. If the sky fills with clouds, refocus on your breath. Refocus on the blue sky. And I hope all that helped you. This was a great episode. I like talking about different things instead of just narrowing it down to one subject. But hey, thank you all for being here and listening to my podcast. I hope. Uh, everything that I do talk about helps you in some way. I will post all of the reference material that I use for these uh, variety of talks. And you can go through those on your own time. Or you can listen to what I was saying. But anywhere, anyway, you know, thanks for being part of this podcast. Again, I will talk to you next week. Bye. As we come to a close, it's my hope this podcast and other sources, such as product reviews that I have discussed today, can better our lives and give us some relief dealing with neuropathy. This episode plus others are posted every Monday on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, iTunes, Spotify, and Stitcher. And finally, whatever life throws at you, even if it hurts you, just be strong and fight through it. Remember, strong walls shake, but never collapse. Talk to you next Monday.